And we're live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Mindset Podcast, helping you flex your mind, body, and soul. In today's episode 100 on the Mindset Podcast, this is your host, Alex Muir, and we have our repeat guest, Todd Nyholm. Todd Nyholm is the author of his latest book, What the Bleep Brain, and many other books that he's uh, written. But again, we're having Todd on again because our our uh, clips from the last uh, last couple episodes that we've had have done very well on TikTok, Instagram Reels. Um, and Todd, welcome back to the podcast. Happy to have you on again and happy to dive into all of the methods, the vital brain method from your book, more in-depth topics into what the bleed brain and welcome back. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk more. You know, this is my favorite subject for sure. Absolutely. And speaking of brain health and speaking of what the bleed brain, where do you kind of see things going with some of the things that you've learned in your life with, you know, improving your emotional regulation, improving your brain health, um, finding ways, using your vital brain method to not kind of overthink, be overstimulated, um, or maybe be in a state of overstimulation, but learning how to that, uh, you know, central nervous system, like keeping that in balance and, and in check. Where do you kind of see things going from what you've learned by writing your book, What the Bleed Brain, for people's long-term brain health? Yeah, I think we're going to find better ways to work with our own system, you know? So I think a lot of people, they're so outside of themselves, they don't realize how much power they actually have inside. And as more people come along and try to teach how people how to do it, and they get more successful with it, I think you'll see, you know, a smaller group and then a bigger group learning how to do it with themselves so that they can change their daily life. Because to me, that's the big thing with this. Like, how do you change your experience of life from day to day so that you're having a better moment by moment experience? So you're not sort of conquered by anxiety or depression or uh, social anxiety, things like that. So that you experience it better and you need fewer things to keep um, distracting yourself with. So it would give us kind of an alternative to being stuck on phones and, you know, on TV screens and all that kind of thing, because we'll be able to regulate ourselves better. So I think that's a big place where some of the work that I'm doing is going and there's going to be more interesting, you know, use of different kinds of um, herbs, I think, and nootropics and things that'll help a lot of people. And, and and I think that'll be kind of interesting to see where it all goes long-term. Absolutely. And I, I, I myself, I'm a big proponent of exploration, adventuring, experimentation, and when I say experimentation, I mean that in all the healthy ways, right? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Um, and like speaking of experimentation and kind of exploring the realm of nootropics, uh, medicinal mushrooms, I I can't remember who told me about it, but I think it, yeah, it was a personal trainer that takes them and he's a huge advocate for medicinal mushrooms. And he's the one that told me because he's had traumatic brain injury, like tons of, uh, he used to play hockey. And he was a hockey goaltender and being in hockey, right? You get hit, you get the slap shot to the fit to the cage um, and it can knock the wind out of you. Right. And pe- people in football, all those contact sports where you're constantly like you getting that head trauma or just that impact where it's just like slam, slam repeatedly to the brain. And it's the brains just getting like bounced around like a basketball not good right so long term that's not good that can probably like i'm not a, i'm not a doctor I'm not trying to be a doctor on the internet or anything but from you know what i've seen uh that's gotta impact the brain health long term and it's gotta potentially cause alzheimer's dementia permanent brain damage right so uh this personal trainer that i you know constantly ask questions i'm, I'm always asking like you know what what trends are you on right now what supplements are you taking how are you training has your training changed and one thing, one area of supplementation that he was talking about was like, Alex, like lion's mane. I take two to three grams of lion's mane per day because of all the concussions that I've had. So can you speak a little bit about maybe any uh, supplements that you take that again, they're supplemental, right? They're not the be all and end all, but maybe some supplements that you take that you truly believe in for long-term brain health, again, in in conjunction along with uh, regular exercise routine, diet, um, sleep, social, social time, um, like social bonding time. Cause again, you can't just take a supplement expected to change your life. It's all the other things, a uh, holistic approach to, to health. So. Yeah, absolutely. Cause like the supplements won't make up for the other stuff. If your diet is terrible, if you're not sleeping, if you don't have connections, if 
you're not able to kind of slow your system down a bit. But once you do, there's a lot of great ones that can work pretty well. Lion's mane is great. Um, phosphatidylserine is quite useful. Um, there are a bunch of products that you can find that package them together. Vincentopine is great. There's a product called Mudwater that has a lot of them put together. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's I've heard a, of that one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it has a lot of them put together, so you can just kind of order it and mix it up. It's it's not the best tasting stuff, but it's not the worst either. You know, it's just like a warm drink you can have. But as Lion's Mane and a couple of the other ones I was just mentioning, I think also keeping your inflammation down is really helpful for your brain. So anything that can help you do that is quite helpful. So curcumin and in some of those other kinds of products. For sure, for sure. And like a big, a big thing that I've been really trying to um, like hone in on, especially is like, like there's a lot of inflammation that's caused from sauce from like the sauce that we put on our food, like the, like the oils, right? Like all, like most of the inflammatory uh, issues that we have on our muscles and our brain are caused by the foods that we eat and the sauces and all that kind of thing. Right. So like try, like talking about avoiding inflammation <laughs> markers, <laughs> it's really, it's really difficult because the inflammatory oils are in everything. And so like a few of them are sunflower oil, canola oil, uh, great or grapeseed oil, like all those oils. Right. And they're literally in every salad dressing and everything. Right. So it's really difficult. So you either got to make it from scratch or you got to look, or you got to spend like 10 to $12 for a salad dressing that doesn't have it. So <laughs> So absolutely so they're everywhere yeah and you combine that with sugar it's really tough right yeah yeah because so. yeah. i i have an easier time limiting sugar than i do with like you know el eliminating all of the inflammatory oils in the diet because it's really hard to do because they're in yeah. absolutely everything right and if absolutely. you go out to eat they're they're in all the restaurants they're cooking with that oil those oils so i mean i don't believe you can entirely eliminate all of them unless you just don't eat out or you don't eat anyone else's food so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Super, super challenging. But yeah, like um, as far as exercise is concerned, like what is kind of some ways that you train now than maybe you used to train? Like, has anything changed in like do you do you mainly do body weight style training or a hybrid of weights and body weight or yeah, at this point I'm mostly doing body weight stuff and a lot of um, you know, kung fu training, different martial arts stuff that I've learned, and then some methods I've made that seem to be really helpful for um my brain health and it kind of connects to the, some of the stuff in the book, but I haven't taught it yet. Those are the things I do the most. I walk quite a bit. I think walking is underappreciated or rucking where you got a backpack or like a weighted vest on. That's fantastic. Somewhat depends on where your health is. You know, as I've gotten through some of the chronic health problems, I can do more or less, you know, but I try to put the things that I can always do together in every day so that there's something I'm doing because it's, it's fantastic for your, your emotional health and your mental health and a bunch of things along those lines. It's, Absolutely. And do, are you someone that does like, do you do like every day that you train, like do body weight training and walking or you do like body weight training three times a week and walking every day kind of thing? I definitely walk every day. I do a fair amount of the body weight training, but there's days I, I certainly take off because your body needs time to heal. Less so from the walking, unless you're doing a hundred miles in a week or something ridiculous. Like that. <laughs> you know, otherwise you can do that pretty much every day, you know? So. Yes, totally. Totally. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. Yeah. Because like I just turned 31 in February and again, recovery, right? Slowly, we need more and more and more time to recover. And so like, same thing, I'm in the same boat as you. Like when I have a day where I hit the weights like really hard and I'm like, I wake up I'm like, Ugh. like, I'm like, oh God, it's, it's, a, it's a stretching day today, right? Yeah. I listen to the body. I'm listening to the body way, way, like way more. And the fun thing is, what people don't realize is like abs are made in the kitchen they're not made in the gym. And I know it sounds like a broken record and probably a lot of people that hear this, but when you just dial in your eating, it's like, tw like that's 80% of the work, 20% of the work is the exercise. But if our eating and everything else is dialed in to as best as possible, then the training, it makes the training 10 times easier. So right. that's yeah. the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't yeah. make up from a bad diet with, you know, working out. It just, you can't do it. No, because you, you need that, that, you need that fuel to keep going because your muscles are constantly breaking down between each, each uh, workout. Right. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it'll accelerate the recovery too, when you're eating really good, really clean too. So, and so far, I know you might not have got a ton of feedback yet on the book because I know it was just released, but 
anyone, friends or family, or anyone that you know that has purchased the book and you've got any feedback or testimonials, um, what has been a common piece of feedback that you've received from readers about the book, what the bleep brand? Yeah, the thing that's been standing out to me most is like some of the people I know and some of my clients read it and they were getting, they got all the way through it and they were able to apply all the methods and then get the re- the base results, which a lot of it was um, increasing their energy, but also feeling more relaxed, significant changes in mood, particularly with depression and anxiety. Those seem to be two really big ones. Another thing I hear is that people, they're able to get out of their thoughts better. So they're no longer stuck and being driven down these um, roads with it. Some of it has to do with sleep. You know, a lot of my clients struggle with sleep way more than I ever would have thought before I started my practice, maybe nine out of 10. So people are sleeping better and deeper and recovering better. Um, that's a lot of the initial stuff at this point, which which has been great. I was wondering if people would be able to pull it out of the book because there's a lot of stuff that you're doing inside yourself with your attention and with your mind. So that was really gratifying to get some feedback along those lines. Yeah. Right on, right on. Speaking of attention, um, since applying these methods in your own life over time, have you noticed that you're taking more time for yourself and you feel that you can, that you're, that you're, um, like less distracted and you're able to focus more holistically on one area during your day, or are you still finding like you're, you know, you have your moments where you get mega distracted and then you need to recenter again. Yeah. At this point, I would say my ability to focus is better than anyone I know <laughs> because I focused on it so hard. Like I rarely think about it at this point we're like 20 years ago was a big thing, you know, to try to keep my attention in one place and I hold it, but I've kind of, I've really zeroed on in on that you know, because it is crucial to everything else that I do. So at this point, that comes pretty easily, but I needed the methods to be able to do that. Like without some kind of like direction and then training yourself to do it, you won't really be able to do it. It's not exactly a natural skill, you know, to just focus and hold it there for minutes or like 10 or 15 minutes or even an hour. It's possible to do, but most people aren't close. And unfortunately with the cell phones and everything we have going on now, we're trained to the other way. So it's like really important to, to work on it. One of my clients was talking about it with the book. She's like, you know, I'm really learning how to pay attention working through the book, just trying to get it into the different parts of the body. So it's a great way to train it. There's lots of ways to do it, but uh, it's a, a really good way to do it and improve your brain health at the same time. Absolutely. And again, it is a practice at the end of the day, right? Like you're practicing to build your 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 muscles, you're, you're practicing to to eat clean. Like it's everything's in life is a practice and our practices are a process and the process turns into habits that stick so any any way that we can improve our processes right they the process gets easier if we make it easier on ourselves then our habits will create better habits and they'll last longer and then it's like automatic and we're not think we don't have to think so hard about things it's just they flow they flow and you're like you feel it and then the more they flow the the less effort that's required yeah and then that becomes your future you know, and that's like how you build the future that you want is just exactly how you described it. And you do it over time. And then it becomes like a flow and an, an effortless movement. And it becomes you, which is super cool. Yeah, yeah I love that. And um, how do you stay updated? Or maybe what's some books that you, you've you personally read or uh, publications or stuff like that to how you stay updated with the latest research in neuroscience? And how does it influence your work? Yeah, kind of a constantly looking around. I think I listen to more podcast interviews than I read at this point because I can do it when I'm driving or when I'm walking. Um, I like Andrew Huberman's work quite a bit with that podcast and Dr. K from Healthy Gamer GG. He's got some amazing um, things to talk about. So lately I've been listening to a lot of that, but I also just read journal articles and kind of flip through stuff. Um, so I, I'm always picking at things to see what I can find. But those two guys I've been listening to a lot lately, and partly because I'm learning from their podcasting style. Um, but uh, that healthy gamer, GG, Dr. K there, he's he's quite wonderful to listen to. Lots of neuro, neuroscience and updated neuroscience because he's a psychiatrist from Harvard. Um, but he also combines it with some of the yogic stuff because he was a monk for a little while. So an interesting place to learn from that stuff as well. Yeah. Right. So I see why I like him. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like all of those things together, right? Like yogi, monk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah awesome. exactly. And what what's the most unexpected uh, uh, like source of inspiration you found while developing your brain training technique? You know, there are a lot of things that I learned from ancient texts that I was digging around. It would be like old yoga masters or uh, martial arts teachers or um, people who were just 
and methods for living life better. And they would just talk about it that way. And then they would describe some method and I'd be reading it and go, wait a second, I think I can do something with that. And I tripped over a lot over the years. So that was probably the most surprising, you know, when you're looking at some of the more modern stuff, you, you know, say like Andrew Huberman, it's, it's a bit more obvious, you know, to talk about it, but sometimes you'll be, you'll just be reading something and you're like, wow, 5,000 years ago, someone said this, and it's been really useful to my process, you know, following their instruction from that long ago. You know? Right on, right on. I, I like how history, even though it's written differently and it's worded differently, sometimes it has a tendency to repeat itself in other texts in the modern text. So it's yeah. it's cool how that looking back can also spring forward in a similar fashion, but just written differently and spoken differently. For sure. Oh, yeah, this is another good one. Um, <laughs> how how do you or how have you approached skepticism from or towards brain training methods, especially from the scientific community? Because I know people in the scientific community are like, oh, you know, that's because they'll nit they nitpick any new methods that people are trying or modalities that people might be advocating for. Yeah. But, you know, as long as you're not claiming to be a doctor and all that kind of stuff, right, which some people try and do, which you got to stay away from that. But yeah. Have you, have you received any kind of skepticism or criticism for this vital brain method, like recently or during along the way? Yeah, there was one lady I tried to send a book to so she could read it. And I had done an interview with her years ago. And she just read um, the paragraph blurb and sent me an email back that said, uh, congratulations on finishing your book. What you're doing can't work at all. Here's a link to my book so you can see that what you're doing can't work. Congratulations on finishing the book. Something along those lines. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I had already read her book. And there's there's nothing in it that actually they support each other pretty well. But she wouldn't need, she didn't even want me to send her the book. And for like three hours, I was like, wait, what does she think I'm doing? She doesn't know what it is. And it, that was before the book was out. So I had only taught, you know, 20 or 30 people that I know personally those methods. So she was kind of jumping to conclusions and then a little bit attacked me. Um, you know, in terms of what it was that she didn't understand. She was very polite about finishing the book, um, but it was interesting. I, I wonder what she thinks it is because she she can't know, you know, she hadn't seen it yet. And this is the first time I put those into print. So, you know, it's a bit of an interesting thing. I, another guy, he said, you know, these are too left brained for me, you know, and that was a little criticism I got. But I did in this particular book, try to make it a little bit linear and logical so you could follow it and then stack them together. So um, in some ways, I understand where he was going with that. But that's kind of the most recent stuff. You know, it always takes you a couple hours. Like, what do they mean when they said that? You know? Yeah. Throws you through a loop. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Now, even myself, like when he says, oh, that's more left brained. What does he mean by that? That's literally all the words he gave me, but I, I kind of think because if you follow through the methods, I'm giving you these ways to to change how your brain is kind of functioning so you get a different brain state. And then I work you through your body in a linear math, you know, where you're going through this part of your brain and then this part of your body to get certain activations to happen. Um, and I think it's this that order of things that was kind of logical. That's like, okay, you got to do these 20 things in a row where he probably wanted something more um I'm, I'm trying to think like spiritual in a way where like there's a uh, big change because you're, right. you're doing this, you know what I mean? A little bit yeah. more right brain and out there and creative as opposed right. to a logical linear structure. I'm guessing. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. 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 But you, the thing is you can get that by doing the process. You get there by doing the process. And like, like I talked about in our last episode, like, like it's taken me years with, a regular meditation practice to be able to lessen my personal anxiety. Cause I'm someone that's just wired a little more anxious. Right. Yeah. And I've made tremendous improvements, but it's still there. It's still hanging in the balance. Like when life gets stressful when the life gets tough, sometimes I veer to I'm like, Oh my God, like I get overwhelmed. I can get overwhelmed easily if I allow myself to. Right. So sure. Uh, like you're talking about the, the process, right? The vital brain method, like utilizing these modalities, it's 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 meant to be a practice and you follow the practice, you follow the tools and the method and eventually it will make improvements, but it's still work. You still got to put in the work. It's not like, it's not going to be like a, like a light bulb that just goes boom, like, oh, like everything's changed. It's like, it's not like that. It's incremental progression towards better brain, long-term brain health. 
And you're training yourself to do something and you're training yourself to function in a little different way. And you're training your body to react a different way. And then your brain to react a different way and your breath to react a different way. And if you train it over a while, you need much less of that method to do it. You you can just kind of like turn it on and off, but you need the process to get there so that you can always come back to it. So yeah, exactly like you said. Yeah. And like eventually the brain will follow the, what the body's telling it to do. It's just in the beginning, if you're someone that's a little more anxious or overwhelmed, or socially awkward, whatever, like the, the, the body needs to, or the brain needs to catch up to the body, right? Because we're, we're retraining the body from like, like you said, the inside out. So that yeah. takes time. That takes time. It's not instantaneous. So, oh, and let's also talk about uh, cell phone use and anxiety and um, stress or being a stressor in our lives. These are absolutely, I know mine's glued to my hip. I know it's a bad yeah. thing, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Like, how do you, um, like when you're in work mode, you're in work mode and do you put on like airplane mode on your phone or do you put your phone in another room? Like, how do you get into like deep work, like Cal Newport, like, boom, like I'm dedicating whatever half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour and a half, whatever your focus period is. Or do you do it into smaller chunks like Pomodoro technique, like put on a timer for 30 minutes, take a break for 10 kind of a thing? Yeah, I tend to like use a timer and I'll often put it somewhere else just because they also have signals that are moving through the air, you know. So if you put it in the other room or leave it in the car, let it charge for a while and set up a timer. I do think it eases people anxiety if they have a timer. Say, OK, I'm only doing this for 30 minutes or I'm only doing it for 10 minutes or whatever might be the time frame that you need because we are kind of attached to it. And if you grew up with it, it might be really difficult to do. Uh, but I think you have to practice that too because you want your mind to be able to become calm. And if it constantly needs stuff going in and out all the time, you're gonna drive yourself just a little bit batty with that, you know? And so you gotta practice, even if it's like two minutes at the beginning and then five minutes and then 10 and say, you know, I'm gonna put this over there for two hours and just go do something else partly as a, an exercise just to not pick it up so that you can get control over that like dopamine loop again, because someone else is controlling it all the time with the phone. And that's a bit of a, you know, a troublesome thing. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's another thing too, is like, uh, I'm someone that I've experimented with re-regulating my dopamine. So, and a couple ways that I've been doing that. And I, I, I don't know if you've seen on my, uh, like I was doing 30 day challenges for a bit. I was doing like skincare. I was doing, yeah. One of one of the ones that stuck with me, which I'm getting back into again, it's just been absolutely frigid cold. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the ice baths that yeah. that so all these experimenting of different habits and routines and challenges throughout that the ice baths is the one for myself and meditation is the ones that stuck and. I don't know why, like, I know it's trendy and it doesn't work for everyone, but for me. Uh -huh. hugest hugest adrenaline rush like just you know if it's a little the water's a little bit colder than you're used to 50 to 60 fahrenheit it's like i get in there and it's just like i literally am re-regulating my dopamine like i'm oh, yeah. going like this i'm just doing a little reset and you get to the point where you're in a meditative state it's crazy because it's a little bit painful it's a little bit uncomfortable and it can be very uncomfortable depending on the temperature <laughs> right yep. and absolutely um, yeah and like i'm ready to like i haven't been doing it like i was doing like every single day right mm -hmm. for like 30 days straight and eventually you just get used to it like anything else and it's crazy you crave that feeling you crave the re-regulation of your hormones with with ice baths so but again it can be done in other ways but but mm -hmm. like i talked about in one of my other podcast episodes heat therapy and cold therapy those two together do crazy things for resetting your nervous system and just feeling that inner sense of calm too. It's crazy. Oh, yeah. And with very minimal time, right? Like I think they said it's 20, 10 to 20 minutes for sauna or steam room. And then uh, like ice bath can be anywhere between like one and five minutes or less. So oh, yeah, they're quick and kind of easy. Like you don't have to like, you have to get yourself into it. Yeah. Yeah. But that's about like the big challenge, right? Yeah. You know? yeah. But the, it's, the impact is huge. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a physiological discomfort, right? That you have to get used to rather than psychological, right? But yeah, you are you are training yourself to reset your your pain tolerance for physiological and, and psychological too. So 
Absolutely. Um, but yeah. Um, mm, oh, I like this. So what are some of the advice that you give to some of your clients or people who've read your book that who feel that they've hit a plateau in their brain training and they're like, Todd, I'm like, I'm doing, I'm doing the protocol. I'm doing the process. I feel stuck at like step like 18 of 20 or 15 of 20. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like this, like I've been doing it five to 10 minutes every single day, seven days a week, 24, seven, three, six, five. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm plateauing. Like, do you, do you feel like I need to switch anything up in my process or take a break maybe and come back to it? And typically what I'll tell them is like they're poised for a big jump at that place. And usually what they need to do, particularly if they're feeling like they want to quit, it's just like, it's like if they were doing 100%, you take them down to like 75 or 80 and you make it really easy. So let's say they were struggling to just remember the methods or work through them like there were 20 steps and they were struggling. We like write them down and just next time you're hanging out outside, go through them without making it like a cutout process and do it a couple times like that so it's just like two or three minutes here two or three minutes there and then do that for a few weeks and usually that gives them a big jump because it's like everything's becoming saturated and then all of a sudden they're like tired or exhausted they don't want to do it and then if you can just get over that hump that's usually when something really cool happens for them it's, it's right usually on. how I, yeah I, I i like it i like it because that's like that's the way um i reached that level when I got to when we were chatting about it in the last episode, like when I got to like one hour of meditation, haven't got back there in a while, but <laughs> yeah, uh, like, cause you're, you're right. You're like, you're saying like, you're reaching that discomfort. You're like, Oh, like this is a lot of thoughts because the longer that you do the session, the more thoughts come up and right. They're like floating, oh. floating along and you're either reacting to them or just acknowledging and, and are, and are aware of them. And, yeah, but definitely. like on the other side of that is absolute bliss. You're just you're just trying to be aware of them. You're not trying to judge them. You're just trying to be like, okay, I see, I see the thought. It's going by. You know, I don't have to react to it. I don't have to judge it. I just have yeah. to sit with it. And that is the toughest uh, thing to learn, I think, in any of these methods. Is sometimes we're sitting with the emotions for a little longer than we're used to, but over time, on the other side of that you do reach a very blissful level and it's, it's a, such a, a feeling of inner peace. Yeah. And then it takes off from there because there's just more and more you can build on top of that. And pretty soon it drags you rather than getting yourself to do it. You're like, Oh, I can't wait to do it. You know, like oh, I've only got 12 minutes to do it today instead of 48 or whatever you might want. And you know, that's when it gets kind of, kind of neat. And once you get past some of those thresholds that happens a bit more. And then usually when you're hitting a threshold, it's just like, some change is happening within you and you just kind of got to keep moving forward. Just one step, one step, keep moving forward. And then psh, something cool will happen. Right on. Right on. Well, uh, appreciate your time, Todd. I, yeah. I loved this episode and I would love to have more. Me too. Yeah, we're, we're constantly getting like awesome, uh, awesome content. And I know the listeners and the people on, on TikTok that are followers and on TikTok and Instagram and, and elsewhere are like gaining a lot of value from this because right. everyone needs to find ways or wants to find ways to improve their brain health and and people need it more than ever because we're uh our attention our attention is not there like it used to be uh we're getting distracted more than ever uh we're attached to our phones and technology so learning uh tools and tactics to take a step away, take a step back from all of the, the changes and the hustle and bustle of the world, right? Like one of uh, this meditation app that I use Oak, they talk mm -hmm. about that. And uh, it was a quote in there. It's like, nature is never in a hurry, but still things still get done. Right. So, and I, that, that, that quote kind of sticks with me. It's like, I know we all feel like we need to rush, but at the end of the day, we really don't need to. We can, we can, we can slow things down a little bit more and it'll be a way better result and a way better feeling. Absolutely. Right on. So Todd, I'll uh, mention it again. Where can our listeners find you? Where are you most active on right now? And how can they connect with you? Yeah, I'm really trying to build up my YouTube channel. So Nitality is the, the name of the system. It's just N-Y-T-A-L-I-T-Y. -T -T um, so Nitality.com and then Nitality on YouTube and, and TikTok and um, the website 
is meant to host everything. So you can always find me over there, but I'm going to really start doing a lot more video content over the next couple months because not everyone reads, you know, as much as I like to read. So I think video might be really helpful and that's, I'm going to move in that direction a bit more. Absolutely. Right on. Appreciate your time, Todd. It was a fabulous uh, episode, episode 100 of the Mindset Podcast. And that's awesome. Looking forward to having you on for more episodes. I'll probably send you some more links for for some future episodes because I like doing it, like neuroscience, brain health, at least one or two of the episodes of that a month because so much people gain so much value from that. And it's so helpful. And your tools and resources in your book and the books that you've written are, again, people need it. So awesome. I'd love to do more. Right on. Appreciate your time, Todd, and uh, looking forward to connecting with you soon. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, man. All right. Congratulations on 100. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>